the Yorkshire Ripper case of the 1970s, with multiple murders and attacks across the conurbations in West Yorkshire, has many parallels with the Jack the Ripper murders in the densely populated streets of the East End of London almost a hundred years before. The parallels go way beyond the superficial common use of the word Ripper. And an examination of the investigation which resulted in the arrest and incarceration of Peter Sutcliffe can inform us about that most notorious of unknown serial killers in world criminal history, Jack the Ripper. Serial killing as a phenomenon seems to be connected to the mass urbanization of society and the relative anonymity, atomization and societal disconnect that results when large groups of unknown people live cheek by jowl. The maintenance of social interconnections becomes problematic in, in these circumstances and these civic bonds act as a check upon the discordant or aberrant behaviour which is innate within a small percentage of the population. It creates an environment in which these abhorrent individuals can operate under a cloak of anonymity. With this in mind, I watched a recent dramatisation of the Yorkshire Ripper murders called The Long Shadow, which aired recently on ITV, uh, which is the main commercial television station in the United Kingdom, for those not, are not familiar. The drama was played out over seven hour long episodes, so it was able to go into considerable detail. The series is still available on the ITVX platform. Peter Sutcliffe, an outwardly normal family man who held down a steady job as a truck driver, was responsible for a series of attacks between at least 1969 and 1980. Some fatal, some not. Many were not initially attributed to him. He posed his victims after death, left them on display to cause shock and awe with whoever found the body and probably to give himself personal voyeuristic satisfaction. He engaged in overkill, inflicting wounds on the victims over and above what was necessary to cause death. Many, but by no means all of his victims were prostitutes. Sex workers, escorts or prostitutes are the most common type of victim chosen by serial killers. It's not a condemnation of the victim to mention their work, nor does it minimize the tragedy of their death. Condemnation should be reserved for a society that places these women in a vulnerable situation. They're usually targeted because they can be persuaded to accompany an unknown killer to a quiet location, rather than the murderer having a grudge against their occupation. The most well-remembered victims of any serial killer were those murdered by Jack the Ripper and were all accurately described as prostitutes. The murders shocked society from Queen Victoria downwards. The police investigation was not downscaled because the victims were prostitutes. Indeed, it cost the commissioner of the Metropolitan Police his job. The victims were certainly not disregarded. But what term should we use? A sex worker might work on chat lines or porn films, and these are not high risk. Escort conjures up misleading images of a paid date at an expensive casino. Prostitute has a harsh ring, but it accurately describes why the victim was at risk and why they were targeted. Our society is a breeding ground for serial killers, so their actions must be understood. We must speak accurately, which is why I use the term prostitute. In the Yorkshire Ripper case, the police assumed that the killer had a particular hatred for prostitutes and targeted his victims because they're prostitutes rather than because they were the most vulnerable and easy group to prey upon as the culprit could get them to go off with them to a quiet location. This police preconception comes out very clearly in the long shadow and had appalling implications for the police investigation. Many of the early non-fatal attacks were on women walking home alone late after a night out. These survivors provided photo fits which all closely matched Sutcliffe, but they were discounted 
because the victims weren't prostitutes. The police also openly made disparaging remarks about prostitutes, much more so than in the Jack the Ripper case of 100 years earlier. One might have expected that attitudes might have improved. Again, this is emphasised in The Long Shadow. When the penny finally dropped, that the Yorkshire Ripper was also murdering non-prostitutes and that every woman was at risk, the police believed that they had driven the Yorkshire Ripper from the red light districts by their efficient patrolling and surveillance operations in those areas. This they believed in a rather typical form of backhanded self-compliment had the unintended consequence of provoking the murderer to widen his target base. I will emphasise again that this is not true, as Sutcliffe was found to have attacked non-prostitutes from before his first murder. In any case, these two factors, the antagonism shown by the police towards prostitutes and the way it skewed the police investigation were exemplified by a notorious statement made by a very senior West Yorkshire policeman, Detective Chief Superintendent James Hobson in 1977, that the unknown murderer hates prostitutes. Many people do. We, as a police force, will continue to arrest prostitutes, but the Ripper is now killing innocent girls. That indicates your mental state and that you are in urgent need of medical attention. You have made your point. Give yourself up before another innocent woman dies. The implication being that prostitutes were not innocent women. Anyone who lived vaguely up north during the Yorkshire Ripper period was affected in some way. My family lived in Cheshire, in the outer suburbs or commuter land of Manchester, and the Yorkshire Ripper crossed over the Pennines Lancashire, specifically Manchester, during his murderous career. We lived in a village that didn't have any street lights, and as a teenager, during the height of the scare, I was tasked with escorting my sister home from a, a local restaurant where she had her first job. That's my Yorkshire Ripper story. The Long Shadow was very well acted and told the story in a compelling manner. It focused on the victims, their family circumstances, their lifestyle and how they met their fate. The drama was also centred around the police investigation, but its emphasis was on the mental cost and strains on the officers involved. Their shortcomings were shown as resulting from their own established, dyed-in-the-wall thinking, primarily their view about prostitutes until almost the last episode, Sutcliffe is vague, unknown spectre, as Jack the Ripper remains to this day. As a consequence of this, the drama missed out several key aspects of the case. Sutcliffe's first, albeit unnamed, spectral appearance was when, after the second murder in May 1976, he attacked Marcella Claxton. She survived and provided a photo fit of the culprit that bore a remarkable similarity to Sutcliffe, but the police rejected the possibility that Marcella was a victim of the Yorkshire Ripper, so this key piece of evidence was disregarded. Yet up till then, the only evidence that the police had to go on was an imprint of a size 7 boot, vague descriptions of possible cars and some tyre tracks. Marcella was to play a significant role in the drama as she exemplified the police attitude towards prostitution. She denied she was a prostitute and the police regarded her as a liar. It also highlighted their blinkered theorising that each attack must be a carbon copy of the others. Marcella was attacked with a hammer but not ripped with a screwdriver or a knife. In Ripperology, you frequently get theorists who insist that each attack must be very similar or at least show some form of linear progression. The sixth murder was in Manchester in October 1977 of Jean Bernadette Jordan. The long shadow highlighted this crime to illustrate that the Ripper was spreading out as Yorkshire was becoming too hot for him. Probably the most significant aspect of this particular murder was not mentioned in The Long Shadow. The killer had given Jean a £5 note that he'd received in his pay packet. Jean had hidden this in a concealed compartment in her handbag before she was killed on some waste ground near some allotments. 
Sutcliffe actually realised his error in not retrieving this note and he later admitted to going back to Manchester to search the body eight days later before the body had been discovered. In his frustration, Sutcliffe attacked the body again in a very brutal manner and attempted to decapitate her. He explained this later flippantly as to make a big mystery of it. The body was discovered that day by someone called Bruce Jones, who went on to become an actor and starred in Coronation Street, which is a well-known UK soap opera for those unfamiliar with it. I, I do have a lot of American viewers. He was the character known as Les Battersby. As he found the body, albeit eight days after she had been killed, Bruce Jones was treated as a suspect. This is correct police procedure and he was given a hard time, but was obviously cleared. But back to that five pound note, it was found in Jean's handbag by the police and was traced to a batch which had recently been issued via a bank in West Yorkshire to several businesses as part of their payroll. The police interviewed 5,000 people who may have received this note, including Sutcliffe, but he was missed despite matching the shoe size and the photo fit. After the Manchester murder, the Yorkshire Ripper returned to his more normal hunting grounds in Leeds in December 1977. But again, the victim, Marilyn Moore, survived and provided another photo fit, which was again a very close match for Sutcliffe. Moore also described Sutcliffe's car, which resulted in another police interview, which Sutcliffe again passed, despite the photo fit the shoe size and the five pound note, but none of these things were joined up. In episode five, there was a key scene that deserves to be highlighted. The original investigating officer, Detective Chief Superintendent Dennis Hoban, is in semi-retirement, has been broken by the case and is confined to his bed, thinking only about the investigation. He is visited by James Hobson, who I mentioned before, and they have this telling, if fictionalised, conversation. It starts with Hoban musing, All this time we've been looking for a monster. Bloody right. What you'll find, even when you do, is someone forgettable. A man who buys his people like you and me, puts up shells, goes for a pint, bickers with his wife, can't speak openly with his mates. A nobody. Not a nobody. That's different. A normal man. Otherwise, you'd have spotted him by now. You've interviewed thousands of people. And what's that tell you? That we will meet him very soon. You've met him already. He's in the system. Bound to be. And of course, Sutcliffe was in the system multiple times. He was hidden in plain sight. All the information was there for him to be caught long before he was actually apprehended and long before he had killed several of his victims. The new head of the investigation, Detective Chief Superintendent George Oldfield, who had already been distracted by letters which claimed responsibility for the murders, when in June 1979, a tape was received from the same source. These items were personally addressed to Oldfield and this undoubtedly turned his head and flattered his ego. It was a personal battle between him and the Ripper. Oldfield wrongly convinced himself that the letters contained information about the crimes that were not in the public domain and that only the culprit would know. One such detail was that they suspected that the murder of Joan Harrison in Preston in 1975 was part of the series. However, shockingly, Detective Chief Superintendent James Hobson, yes him again, was quoted in the Yorkshire Post in 1977, two years before the tape was received, as saying, We are also following up a possible link with a similar type of murder in Preston in November 1975 when a prostitute was found stabbed to death in the town centre. Joan Harrison wasn't a prostitute and wasn't stabbed. However, it's more remarkable 
that Hobson didn't remember publicly making the link when that link being only privately suspected by the police was one of the key reasons why Oldfield believed the hoax letters and the tape were genuine. Also, the saliva on the letter matched the blood group of the person who had licked Harrison, although that only narrowed it down to one in 20. However, Harrison was not a victim of the Yorkshire Ripper. Sutcliffe, when arrested, denied it. And in 2011, DNA evidence established that someone else was responsible. In any case, thereafter, the police were convinced that the culprit must speak with a Geordie or rather Wearside accent. He became known as Wearside Jack. I remember rival Leeds United and Sunderland supporters chanted the taunt, There's only one Jack the Ripper and Jack the Ripper is me da. For the police, the focus on the killer's accent became totally single-minded which was an astonishing example of confirmation bias. I hope you're enjoying this episode so far. There's plenty more highly significant information to come, but please subscribe, like and comment below on what you think about this video. In episode six, we finally see a routine police visit to Peter Sutcliffe's house. It was carried out by Detective Constable Andy Laptu in July 1979. He became suspicious of Sutcliffe after reviewing all the inter interconnections. But because Sutcliffe didn't have a Geordie accent and his writing didn't match the letters that accompanied the tape, Latchew's suspicions were dismissed out of hand by his superiors. Sutcliffe went on to murder three more victims after this. In the last episode, naturally, we reached the denouement. Sutcliffe was arrested, not as a result of shrewd detective work, but after a routine stop with a prostitute in his car. Undoubtedly, she would have been his next victim. His luck ran out, just as she was incredibly fortunate. Probably, Sutcliffe was complacent as he was in Sheffield, South Yorkshire, an area where he hadn't committed any previous crimes. He was arrested as he had false number plates and then gave the false name of John Williams, which was a name that he had family connections to. But this subterfuge collapsed very quickly. Sutcliffe had hidden his hammer and knife in an alleyway near where his car was found and had deposited them there when claiming he needed to relieve himself. But the police, once their suspicions were aroused, went back and found them. It must be said that as this was in South Yorkshire, police suspicion about the man they had in front of them wasn't deadened by his lack of a Geordie accent. Also, and this wasn't shown in the dramatisation, when he was arrested, Sutcliffe was found to be wearing a V-neck jumper as a form of long johns or thermal underwear. This was undoubtedly part of his murder apparel, so he could easily expose himself to the victim, probably as part of his post-mortem ritual. Although some survivors reported that he exposed himself to them as they lay in a semi-unconscious state after he attacked them with a hammer. This incidentally was one of the factors which disproved Sutcliffe's claims that he was suffering from schizophrenia as it showed that he went out equipped in a premeditated manner. I'll draw out the following similarities between the Yorkshire Ripper and Jack the Ripper cases, some of which I've already alluded to. The killer in both instances practiced overkill, wounding the body many more times than necessary to cause death and performing extensive post-death mutilations. It's been suggested that this is out of some sort of frustrated lack of control or power in the culprit's normal day-to-day -day life. In both series, the bodies were deliberately posed as part of the killer's post-death ritual, probably to cause shock and awe with the finders, or more likely the police, and probably also to give the killer voyeuristic satisfaction that they could play over in their minds afterwards. Letters were sent to the police in both instances claiming to come from the culprit. In the Yorkshire Ripper case, they were all hoaxes, although in the case of Wearside Jack, 
the police believed the hoax to the point of obsession with fatal consequences to the last three victims. Sutcliffe even said, Whatever that was going on, I felt safe. I'm not a Geordie. I was born in Shipler. The Wearside Jack communications had deliberate references to the Jack the Ripper letters as the person responsible, John Humble, who was eventually arrested in 2005 due to DNA analysis, had a fascination for Jack the Ripper. For example, one passage in one of his letters read, that photo in the paper gave me fits. The Dear Boss Jack the Ripper letter had a passage saying, That joke about leather apron gave me real fits. The letters were signed Jack the Ripper and Humble claimed, My purpose was to rid the streets of them sluts and warn whores to keep off streets because I feel it coming again. This of course chimed with West Yorkshire Police's preconceived belief that the Yorkshire Ripper was specifically targeting prostitutes. In the Jack the Ripper case, the police clearly initially believed the first letters they received were genuine, as they authorised that they, re they be reprinted in newspapers across the country, although these communications did not derail the investigation as it did in the Yorkshire Ripper case. In both cases, the police fixated on the wrong target with their own prejudices in forming suspect selection. We have seen in the case of the Yorkshire Ripper, there became an obsession that the culprit must have a Geordie accent. In the Jack the Ripper case, after becoming initially obsessed with finding Leather Apron, the police settled on types, itinerant lodging house dwellers, foreigners, particularly Jews, inmates in lunatic asylums, recent suicides, gay people who were thought to hate women and be sexually insane, recidivistic criminals. Serial killers do not tend to be found among these groups. They are a type all of their own. In both cases, in most serial killing cases where one murder quickly follows another, the police suffer from information overload with more and more leads to follow. In the Yorkshire Ripper inquiry, their filing system couldn't cope and cross-referencing became impossible. In both cases, caused in some measure by information overload, there was a failure to follow up properly on suspects or people of interest. Sutcliffe was interviewed nine times. He matched the photo fits, he had the right shoe size. He had a gap in his teeth which matched bite marks. His car matched witness descriptions. He was regularly seen in red light districts. He was issued with a five pound note from the batch that was found on a victim. But he didn't have a Geordie accent and came across as a normal family man. We know that Lechmere was not properly investigated by the police, as we know they never discovered his true name, which was Lechmere and not Cross as late as the 19th of October 1888, Detective Chief Inspector Donald Swanson refers to him just as Cross, and we know the police like to record true names. The police were looking for foreigners, madmen and standard criminals, not normal family men. Sutcliffe was not put off killing despite coming under suspicion and being interviewed nine times. It sometimes claimed that Lechmere should have been put off after he had to appear at the inquest into the death of Polly Nichols. Actually, serial killers aren't easily put off. For example, John Reginald Christie of 10 Rillington Place infamy testified against Timothy Evans at his trial in 1950 for murders that he had himself committed and then went on to commit four more murders before he was caught. Sutcliffe like Lechmere, gave an alternative name linked to his family when he was arrested. Although in Sutcliffe's instance, the subterfuge didn't last very long, as tends to be the case when criminals who give false names come under the microscope. Sutcliffe was a lorry driver, the most common occupation for serial killers. Lechmere was the 19th century equivalent, a carman. It isn't because being a lorry driver or a carman 
would turn a sane man into a psychopathic serial killer. It's because someone who is already a psychopath in that occupation and who has the potential to become a serial killer becomes familiar with streets and routes that take them across cities where they see potential victims and think through or fantasize about what they could do and how to carry it out while at work. Lastly, I mentioned that Bruce Jones, Les Battersby if you prefer, was closely questioned as a potential suspect after finding the body of Jean Bernadette Jordan. He actually blamed the heavy-handed police approach for the breakup of his marriage alongside the trauma of seeing the disemboweled body, part of the deliberate shock and awe ritual of the Ripper. Jones had an allotment close to where he found the body with another man over a week after she had been killed. That tied him to the crime scene and I guess the police thought that maybe he brought the other man along as, uh, to show his surprise and innocence. The police were correct in examining Jones as he was a valid suspect. It's a pity that the police didn't do likewise with Lechmere. As I've already mentioned, they clearly didn't investigate him at all. And had they done so, the Jack the Ripper murders might have been nipped in the bud. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, like and share, ring the notification bell, and of course comment. We have healthy debates on all these videos.